Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. Today's podcast is sponsored by Austin Private Wealth, a registered investment advisor focused on fee-only financial planning and investment management. Their mission is to serve affluent clients with personalized financial advice, fostering a trusted relationship that will endure for generations to come. Austin Private Wealth is not just about managing wealth. They're about inspiring you to embrace a future filled with possibilities and helping you architect enduring legacies. Their core values of integrity, service, caring, excellence, and growth are at the heart of everything they do. Connect with them today at austinprivatewealth.com. Austin Private Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Austin Private Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Austin Private Wealth unless a client service agreement is in place. Investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. Over the course of the pandemic, migration trends already taking place were accelerated. It's an open secret now that the middle of the United States is a key engine of our nation's growth. Over the past decades, we've seen the ups and downs economically, mostly tied to manufacturing. But today, places like Austin, Denver, Chicago, and Nashville are tech and innovation hubs as well. We wanted to explore the growth and changes in this region in more detail, so we're joined by Dale Buss, founder and executive director of the Flyover Coalition. The Coalition is a non-for-profit organization that he established to promote the economic and social interests of the region between the Great Lakes and the Gulf, the Appalachians, and the Rockies. Dale's a veteran journalist and author who has been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and a top editor at major metropolitan daily newspapers in Milwaukee and Tampa Bay. Now, he's a contributor to publications including Forbes, Chief Executive Magazine, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Dale, welcome to the Austin Next Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's great to have you. So let's start off with the big question. How would you describe flyover country? I'm assuming it's more than just not the coast. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would probably provide three explanations for what flyover country is. First of all, as we define it at the Flyover Coalition, geographically, it's America between the Great Lakes and the Gulf Coast and the Appalachians and the Rockies, basically. I don't want to get too precise about that, but actually in our logo, we try to be careful to include states that we think are point of mind wise part of flyover country like Florida, like Georgia, like West Virginia, like Colorado, maybe the eastern half of it. And so it's, it's which suggests the third thing that I want to mention, which is flyover country is a state of mind. And, and part of that has been uh, defined maybe by the coasts and the coastal media over the years. They're obviously the, they're the ones who came up with the, uh, the Appalachian flyover country. And I want to point out that Austin is definitely part of flyover country. Texas is. Sometimes people in the Midwest will argue with me like, well, they're, they're their own thing, you know, and they've got it going too well. They can't be part of the downtrodden rust belt. I'm like, yeah, but attitudinally and, you know, maybe they show the way to us, right? I mean, that's certainly important, I think, to think of Texas and in Austin in that way. And I guess maybe the fourth point is flyover country is an antidote to the coast in a sense. All the power centers are on the coast, right? You got marketing and finance in New York. You've got obviously the federal government in Washington, DC. You know, we've always had Hollywood and the cultural elite on in California. Then we added Silicon Valley and big tech and all the power that they have. And, and so I used to talk about those four power centers. Well, not, now I think you really have to add Seattle. It used to be Microsoft, but now Amazon is, is taking over the world of retailing and, and so much else. So um, that leaves us with what, Chicago? <laughs> so I, I think it's, so it's partly geography, point of view, attitudinally, and kind of in, in opposition to, to what the coasts are and have. So what kind of got you started on, on this effort and, how has your advocacy efforts been used by different decision makers? Well, I'm a, a journalist by trade and worked for the Wall Street Journal for many years. And then I was a, a 
editor of Metro Dailies in Milwaukee and in Tampa and the Tampa Bay area. I've lived all of my life in one part of flyover country. I know that I've lived in Dallas. I've lived in Florida, lived in Pittsburgh, from Wisconsin, most of my life in Michigan. So this is where I'm from and this is, you know, what's important to me. And, and really, I've been kind of slowly building the Flyover Coalition over several years. And I will say slowly, because I'm a, a journalist, have been for ever since I was 12 years old, trying to do that while building interest in this organization. And so what I've found is it resonates with people. Nine out of 10 people will say, I don't like, I love the term Flyover Coalition. It just, it captures it. One out of 10 will say Flyover, you know, that's that's pejorative, that implies weakness, that, impl- that just kind of plays into what the coasts say about us. And I'm like, okay, the whole point is to make this ironic, not descriptive. You know, let's take that, like a jujitsu move, right? Like, we'll take it and, and run with it and, and make it our own. So what I've been trying to do is build advocacy around the notion of not only identifying with flyover country, but saying, what can we do collectively to grab hold of this region's prospects and bootstrap and you know, while not trying to be divisive from the coast, let's unify in this region that had, we all have so much in common and we have so far to go to compete with the coast. Let's rally around that. And so I'm getting some traction with that. We had a conference last fall um, around food and ag tech where you know, I had like 25 CEOs, uh, policymaking people, I had the governor of Indiana. We all agree we need to do more cooperatively but there is that aspect of competition, right? So you got in Texas, you got this big thing going with California, but you're also competing, you know, on a lesser, to a lesser extent, with places like Indiana that's this business friendly, and you know other states around you. So there's always that competition for economic development, and yet in the big picture, I would I would posit that you know we need to kind of draw together as a region and Heartland Forward, the Walton Foundation uh, established that research organization. That's an example of the kind of thing that we need. And there are also things like uh, cooperation in the Midwest around establishing EV charging stations, uh, around boosting our power grid. And of course, you know, in Texas, that can be a problem, but it's an attitude and it's, I think it's slowly gaining traction. And it's funny how the idea of the flyover country has really been changing over the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, you you talked about, you know, does Texas really matter because it's part of the downtrodden, um, you know, uh, Rust Belt, but then you talk about like the, you know, EVs, right? And how just the definition of what's happening here, even if it's in manufacturing or in other things, is really starting to change. So, I mean, how is the area starting to see itself, right? And be able to go forward? Well, a couple of things, well, three things really. First of all, I think that we're seeing more possibilities in the digital era and the post COVID era for creating and bolstering places in flyover country that can in some ways compete with what's going on on the coast. And Austin, of course, is the shining example of what can happen. I mean, if you talk with people, a lot of CEOs, as I do all the time, Austin is now in the same breath with you know, Boston, Silicon Valley, Seattle, in terms of uh, being a, a hot spot for technology. So it's part of that conversation already. I think also there are these legacy industries in flyover country, all across flyover country. And as as the economy itself digitizes and every industry after another digitizes, these legacy advantages are gonna start to play out for flyover country. So in Texas, obviously it's energy, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, It's computers, I mean, Dallas, Fort Worth, strong there. In Columbus, Ohio, it's insurance. There's a lot of insurance companies in Ohio. In Chicago, it's food. Um, in Detroit, it's obviously automotive. So there are these clusters of and concentrations of legacy businesses that are all digitizing, and that creates all these new opportunities to fly over country. And also, I think part of it is you mentioned EVs. The very by very dint of our geography, we have a huge advantage. I mean, everything going back and forth to the coast has to go through us, right? So there's this boom in distribution and logistics, which is exemplified by what Amazon is doing, and yet. All these warehouses and stuff have to, you know, a lot of them have to be in flyover country. You look at EVs, all the announcements by the automakers lately in the last few months have been, we're going to sink tens of billions of dollars into the Mid-South, Kentucky, Tennessee, into Michigan. This is where EVs are going to be built. You know, it's not going to be some isolated Tesla plant out in 
San Francisco Bay Area. I don't think that's that's long for this world. It's going to be the center of the country where traditional automakers are going to be taking on the Teslas and the Rivians of the world. And all this stuff's going to be built out here. And to the extent we can hold on to the intellectual property involved and help develop that, it's all going to it's all going to benefit flyover country. It's interesting you talk about the uh, Tesla plant in Fremont and you just said, well, you don't think it's going to be long for this world. I agree with you. But if you look at the nation as a whole and you look at the coasts, how have the coasts really impacted some of these changes in flyover country over the last decade or so? Well, I think the biggest thing you'd have to say is that big tech has influenced everything, right? So to the extent that everything has become digitized, the rest of the country has to, to follow suit. So just take Amazon, for example. Um, now they start out with books. Now they sell everything. Uh, you look at how Amazon has impacted traditional retailers in, in flyover country, whether it's you know Dillard's in the South or Macy's in the Midwest. Those retailers have been decimated to a great extent by what Amazon has accomplished. Then you look at Walmart, which is trying to go toe-to-toe with Amazon and fighting back. And everything that's happened because of what's going on on the coast, particularly with Amazon, has influenced how Walmart has responded and what Walmart has become. And now I think last week there was something about Walmart is making investments in the metaverse. So, you know, Mm -hmm. you might not have predicted that 10 years ago. You know, and just clearly, as I mentioned earlier, all the power centers are on the coast. So everything that happens in this country, you know, seems to originate there, unfortunately. Even things like the um, the state and local tax situation with, with what they're trying to put together in Washington, where under Trump, you know, the, the blue um, states were disadvantaged because of the cap on, on mortgage deductions. Well, that seems to be coming back. So every dollar that they get to deduct in New York and California is one less dollar that maybe benefits us out here. And, and I guess that's my concern is how can we you know, craft our own future and bootstrap ourselves and define ourselves as a region? You can't do it apart from the coast, but you can certainly do it maybe alongside those influences and in spite of those influences. And so maybe we can talk a little bit more about what, what that will take. Well, let's talk about it a little bit more in terms of what that will take. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're not talking about separating the country, but... That you're, what you're describing is much more of a competitive set with flyover country and the coasts yeah. than, you know, the derogatory term that created flyover country 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was. What's that competition going to look like? What are we going to have to do in the central part of the United States to, uh, to succeed and to grow? One thing is, you know, take further advantage of, of what the pandemic has done in terms of loosening those tethers that, that used to tie people to their jobs um, physically. You know, everybody's been anticipating a flyover country, maybe an influx from the coast. That may be happening to some extent. It looks like mainly what's happened though is people in, in say New York and LA, Boston are saying, you know, maybe I'll just move out to the suburbs. I'm not gonna take off for Austin or Omaha or you know, Little Rock. Um, I'm just gonna move out to the suburbs, make, make my life a little a little easier. So I'm not sure we benefit as much from that as we could, but I do think that the general idea that anybody can work anywhere uh, is in our favor. And and so I think in flyover country, we need to take advantage of that. We need to take advantage of what uh, is known as placemaking. So you attract people, you know, Austin, I think is until maybe lately has done a really good job of that, you know, creating that kind of local ecosystem where it's just a place that people want to live, right? Your foodies, your, your tech, you've got all these great uh, events going on. You've got the University of Texas, you've got the state government, you've got a, a lot of elements to work with there to create a place that is attractive to people. And that's the kind of thing that needs to happen around flyover country. Places like Indianapolis uh, you know, has a pretty good jump on what it takes to, to make a place that's attractive to, to millennials with the tech jobs that they have, with the cost of living, uh, available housing, that kind of thing. So that, that's going to be really important. I think, too, that it's going to be, in the longer term, we're going to need to take advantage not only of those factors, but of things that are going to favor us over the coast. And I hate to bring it up, but climate change. To the extent that the climate is changing, maybe it's just a stretch of bad weather, whatever it is, that's a different discussion. But let's say the climate is changing, the seas are rising, suddenly those 
condos in Miami Beach and, uh, you know, the, the stuff on the shores of the Atlantic and the Pacific don't look so inviting. I mean, we've, you know, we're inland, right? So that's a factor. Fresh water is a factor. I know sometimes that's a problem in Texas, but up here in the Great Lakes, you know, we've got it. We've got it. What? How do we preserve it? How do we exploit it economically without you know, kind of ruining that advantage? So there are trends definitely that we need to sort of take advantage of. And I think also because of the overreach by progressives in, in Washington, I think you're seeing kind of a backlash. I'm not necessarily talking politically, although that's happening, but you're seeing, you know, people saying, I don't know, these people on the coast, they're getting a little bit crazy, right? And big tech and what they want to do. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg wants to create an alternative universe to live in. Well, let him let him go there. Meanwhile, you know, we're out here living and working and manufacturing plants and farms. And I think there's a, a sense maybe regionally that, you know, we're, we're seeing the world a little differently, I guess. Let me let me explore one of the issues that we talk about with with what we've named the Austin narrative. And part of that is that when Jason's family and my family moved from California, we were looking at the shrinking, if not elimination, especially in Northern Cal, of the middle class. Yeah. Here in Austin, even though um, housing has become more expensive, you could still have what my parents thought of as a middle-class lifestyle mm -hmm. with a manufacturing job. You look at Tesla and you look at the new Gigafactory, which is opening any minute now. Yeah. And they're bringing in people at decent salaries and homes around there are not overly expensive so that you can have, you know, the, the married couple, two to quarter kids in a garage with a white picket fence and in flyover country, I think there's a lot of places where you can do that. Yeah. On the coast, it's becoming less and less. So is that one of the issues that's happening that's that's building this division, if you will? Oh, absolutely. It, it is. And to the extent that people, you know, say in Austin or the rest of flyover country are taking advantage of that, recognizing, you know, the leverage that that gives them, I think it's it's happening a lot. I mean, if you look at just look at San Francisco, the number of people who've indicated that they're going to leave, trying to leave, you know, I, you were in California, you know, that whole situation a lot better than, than I do. There's a flight from, from New York uh, to some extent to the suburbs, but also to elsewhere. I, I think that that kind of narrative is, is crucial. You know, it's not just, it's millennials and it's the next generation too. Where can I live? And be 15 minutes from, you know, kayaking in some river. Where can I be? Where can I have that white picket fence and that and that house that's affordable? You know, with a, you know, a three-row SUV in in the driveway. That's the, you know, quote unquote American dream that that I wasn't sure would ever happen with the millennial generation, but I think it's pretty clear to a great extent that is happening. It's just been delayed, and so who knows what the next generation is going to want to do, but that's clearly a trump card for flyover country. It's housing affordability, um, overall affordability with quality of life. And that's why the placemaking, you know, is important. I mean, you can have a great life in Omaha, right? And there are tech companies from California that are establishing operations there. They're like, they can make that promise to their employees. So it's not just native Nebraskans. It's other people saying, look at this place. I mean, okay, it's not on the ocean, but that's about it. <laughs> Everything else is pretty good. There you go. Yeah, I want to drill down a little bit more. We have lots of areas within flyover country. So here's my question. I mean, are, are these areas really islands? I mean, we're talking now about the Texas Triangle mm -hmm. with Dallas, Houston, and the Austin, San Antonio areas. They're becoming more and more interconnected. But when you look at Chicago and Nashville and mm -hmm. in Indianapolis and... Is that same thing happening across state borders? Not as much as it should be. And that's kind of the whole point. Um, I mean, I remember a few years ago when Rick Snyder, a Republican, he, um, he was a founder of CEO of Gateway Tech Company. He became governor of Michigan. And I interviewed him about this. And he said, you know, we have more cooperative agreements with Ontario than we do with any state that's contiguous to us. There is this 
competition, obviously, for economic development. Flyover country is so big that, you know, the idea of like a Texas triangle somewhere else is pretty, is pretty difficult to construct. You know, Chicago's its own thing, uh, huge and sprawling. And yet, you know, there's competition with Wisconsin and Indiana. They don't necessarily connect all that well. As I mentioned earlier, there are things in technology developments and in the economy. Generally, they're kind of forcing this issue. For example, a few weeks ago, the governors of five Midwestern states, uh, Republicans and Democrats, got together and said, we need to build an EV charging network across our states, across the upper Midwest. And there's going to be a certain amount of cooperation, right, that's going to have to occur because of that. And that's going to bring companies together and governments together. And there's also identification around industries that sprawl across flyover country. That's that, that, that identification regionally is already there. Turning it into kind of advocacy of our region is another thing. So auto manufacturing, right, it used to be around Michigan, the, Michigan and the Great Lakes. Now it's from Detroit down through Huntsville, Alabama, you know, Atlanta, San Antonio, Austin with, with Tesla. That's a huge industry that in many ways unites the needs and advantages of flyover country. And if you look at food and ag too, uh, the reason we at the Flyover Coalition chose our first event, our, a virtual conference we had last November around food and ag tech is because we're still the breadbasket of the world across flyover country, right? California has almonds and dates and produce and stuff like that. But I mean, we still produce the vast majority of milk, meat, row crops, you name it. And as technology has in, uh, invaded and, and improved food and ag tech, you know, again, there's, there's a huge commonality for companies and states and localities across flyover country to try and make it work all together, you know, even while they make their individual cities work. So it hasn't happened to the extent it should have. And that's, you know, one of the things we're trying to advocate. You've named specific areas and specific industries tagged to those areas. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at Austin and, you know, we see this very diverse set of industries. I mean, we have manufacturing growing next to semiconductors, next to spacecraft, next to social media, and of course, tech. And food. And food. Yes. Got to have the barbecue. A lot of startups there, you know, the Whole Foods, uh, ethos and all of that. There you go. Is this kind of, of sector diversification happening elsewhere in flyover country? Well, it, it is. I mean, there are certain, you know, cities like Chicago, which is started out diverse, right? I mean, there's manufacturing, there's food, but there's a huge tech scene in Chicago. Chicago and Illinois have their own problems in terms of being one of those, you know, true rust belt, tax laden, crime ridden kind of cities that, that uh, you know, they really have a, a unique problem, I think, in flyover country that they're trying to crawl out of. But if you look at a place like southeastern Michigan, where I live, historically automotive, right? But that has taken automakers into all sorts of areas of technology, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, EVs, and there's a huge uh, tech ecosystem building in a place like Ann Arbor around the University of Michigan. And there have been three or four unicorns spawned out of Ann Arbor you know, just in the last couple of years. Now, that doesn't compare with Texas or, or California, certainly. But you see these areas broadening. And, and, and it is, it's all about tech, of course, but it also is still about how do you tap into those legacy industries? How do you how do you tap into the thousands of engineers uh, that are in the Metro Detroit area and make yourself as an automaker competitive with a Tesla, which is coming at it from a whole different point of view? You know, if you're a big CPG food company in Chicago, you're Kraft Heinz or Mondelez or, or somebody like that. How do you harness the legacy of all these food developers that you have in Chicago to compete with the startups? You know, the companies like Serenity Kids from Austin, you know, they're nibbling away at your, your sales and market share. Technology is part of it, legacy advantages, and just the recognition that, you know, we need to kind of work on the base that we have and improve it in order to compete in the future. I want to get selfish for a second. And I want to talk about uh, your opinions on Austin itself. So from your perspective, you know, what are the strengths of the Austin ecosystem and how is that similar or different than the rest of the, uh, the general regions? Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I've been in Austin. I worked for the wall street journal in Texas 
decades ago. I've been back to Austin once before the boom now. But I've, I've actually written a lot about Austin, and it started with interviewing food startups, uh, people from Whole Foods, because that's one of the verticals that I've covered a lot as a journalist. So to me, that suggests one of the huge strengths of Austin, as one vertical after another, the city has grown, is the sense that people understand there what an ecosystem is, you know, how they have to help one another, how you, you build brick by brick into an industry that all of a sudden is a global player. I mean, it used to be in the food business, it used to be Boulder, Colorado is the, you know, the innovative place. Um, but now I think Austin has really taken over. So as you, you know, clearly in terms of, of, of being a, a center of big tech with all the uh, outlets you've got there from the Silicon Valley companies and your homegrown companies, that's obviously a huge advantage to the extent that you're moving into manufacturing and you've got these associations with other manufacturing plants in Texas. I think that's important. It was interesting you talked about housing, Michael, because I remember last year doing some reporting on Austin for Chief Executive Magazine, because every year Texas is number one in best business climate uh, in the opinion of CEOs. And there was a lot of concern about the housing stock and, and prices going up 20, 30, 40% in some cases. So it's really interesting to hear that you think maybe the city can maintain a handle on that. Because to me, that's important, right? Because you don't want to become the next Silicon Valley in terms of squeezing people out. People move from California to Austin in search of opportunity. And then, okay, <laughs> I think we just left a place like this. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to mention. I, I interviewed Governor Abbott last year. And it could, people think about Austin and they think, okay, everybody's moving from California to Austin. They're basically progressives wanting to go to Austin and make Austin, you know, kind of an intolerably blue place in, in the terms of, in terms of regulations and that kind of thing that California is. I don't know if it's still true, but what he told me is their research showed that the, the governor's office research showed that basically people are self-selecting, you know, more and more Californians who have a conservative bent, business oriented, entrepreneurial move into Austin maybe people moving out of Austin and Texas to California who don't like what that has made the place. So in any event, it seems to me that the political balance that Austin has, you know, I think you had a vote last year to, to uh, try and do something about the homeless problem, right? I mean, has got to be one of, one of your great strengths. If, if Austin can be seen as the reasonable uh, bluish or purplish place in, in, a, in a red state, to live and grow. I mean, that's obviously a, a huge, huge attraction that a place like Silicon Valley or Boston doesn't have. So from, from the outside, but somebody who's rooting for Austin, that's kind of what I see. Yeah, a couple of things. One, um, I think I've read your article with the quote from Governor Abbott. Mm -hmm. So I saw that. I think it was Rick Perry when he was governor talked about Austin being the blueberry in the bowl of tomato soup. There you go. <laughs> um, as far as housing goes, and and I think this has been true of lots of places. We talk about Austin. We talk about Central Texas. We talk about ASA, Austin, San Antonio. And more and more of the housing is not in the city of Austin, but rather in the, the five-county area around Austin. And I think that's the buffer that we have here. The regulatory aspect and, and whether or not we're going to become more and more blue is, is, I think, up in the air right now. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to watch. Um, we spoke to the CEO of the Round Rock Chamber of Commerce uh, a few months back. And, you know, his bit, the, the complaint that everybody was making of him was that, hey, we didn't land this deal. We didn't land that deal. And it was like, I can't put together a 500 acre parcel. Everything's developed in Round Rock. Mm -hmm. I can do yeah. 20 acres kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that's true because you look at the Gigafactory is in... South, Southwest Austin, uh, near the airport, the new Samsung plant is Northwest Austin, actually Taylor, Texas. Mm -hmm. Micron's looking at something similar. So we're seeing a much bigger area than the city itself. And I think that's the buffer that we have. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting because to some extent, your development is going to self-limit because if you can't put together too many more parcels, you know, that could fit a gigafactory that's going to maybe in a good way slow down your development. I know here in Michigan, there was a big to-do a few weeks ago because Ford uh, announced that it was going to put huge new uh, 
EV and battery plants in Kentucky and Tennessee. And the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, was like, well, what about Michigan, your home state? And Ford said, look, we're doing a lot here, and they are. But you guys don't have a parcel big enough for us to, to really do what the kind of footprint we want to do with EVs. And so immediately the Michigan legislature kind of scrambled to, to try to address that problem. I also wonder in Texas, I mean, to what extent is competition with the other points of the triangle, you know, part of this? I mean, DFW, the Metroplex, I remember they called it when I lived there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, they've got a little bit different political orientation, kind of a Jerry Jones type of thing. They're really competitive with Austin for for jobs and, and tech jobs, I would think. And, and San Antonio's its its own thing. And there's even Waco. I don't know. How does that all play out in, in Austin? I think one of the things as I'm seeing is you have kind of back to what you said, this interesting competitive dynamic that goes on, but it's close enough. One of the things that, you know, just speaking from experience, you know, we were um, from San Diego and, you know, I had – just as an example for personally, I had networks in LA, Orange County, the Bay Area, but not a lot of actual integration of them. It's, you know, single one-off types of things. What's been, I think, very different here is while there's absolutely that kind of um, competition, both within the triangle and then even within, you know, the regions itself, like there's, you know, as we said, Samsung went to Taylor and it's an interesting dynamic of, well, you have to, you know, have that inter-regional competition because they didn't pick Austin itself, right? Even though they have their other plant here in Austin. Um, yeah. But there is that interconnectedness. I mean, you know, we've only been here for about a year and, you know, I already have, uh, you know, decent connections in San Antonio, Houston, Dallas. It does seem to be more connected with that kind of, you know, Still, my place is the best versus yours, which is which is wonderful. I, I, you want to have that kind of – to succeed, you need to have that kind of local superiority complex. If you're always kind of looking up as, well, we want to be just like them. And then you saw that with the Silicon X, right? Everyone wanted to be the next Silicon Valley versus now I think everyone wants to be the first Austin, the first Dallas, the first Houston, the first yeah. – you know. Um, yeah. So I think that's something. Also, I think to your point, what's been interesting is the – we have the land – for these types of, you know, growth projects, they're just not, it's, a, it's, it's not, the city of Austin itself is having a different, like we're having, I think was recently announced, like going to be the, one of the tallest buildings in Texas is, is, is just being designed, right? So you're having that type of um, go, but then you have Bastrop has something like a 500 acre uh, movie studio being built, right? And that's about 20 minutes or so, 20, 30 minutes east. You have Taylor, yeah. Lockhart's uh, creating plants. So you have that dynamic, and then you also have the dynamic of when you say, you know, the housing prices have been an issue, obviously, but we build, which is something I'm not used to, right? Like in the last, you know, 12 months, my stats may be slightly off, but, you know, we started 25,000 houses in the Austin general area versus, you know, where we came from uh, in San Diego, that same period was 4,000. And that was with a million more people in the metro. So yeah. you wow. see the ability to actually, you know, break ground and and build our way out of this does it help you know housing prices in the next three months no obviously not but it's one of those things that there is that you know let's build attitude i think is a real big um point in our favor well and i think too i mean as i said I, every year i write uh the package for chief executive magazine which is based on a poll of ceos about the best and worst business climates in the country I think it's been going on 15 years now. Texas has been number one every single year. And I know some people were thinking they may have faltered a couple of years ago. Well, maybe last year after the, you know, the power thing and, you know, stumbling in the oil and gas business because of COVID and, and whatever, but that hasn't happened. And when you talk to CEOs, it's like Texas is, is, is the Holy grail. So the attitude, you know, the availability of all these different kinds of places in the state, the extent to which there is, you know, sort of cooperation among you, and then the oppositional point of view between Texas and California, you know, it's such an interesting contrast. And I'm sure this year, I'm, we're just starting to work on the package now, Texas will be number one again. So, I mean, that's a huge boost for everybody in Texas and probably Austin more than anybody else because, you, you know, you're kind of nudging into the lead there in terms of development and, and drawing jobs. Mm -hmm. We have the narrative of, you know, Texas being number one in, in, as you said, the CEO, and I've seen lots of places to do business, those kinds of things. And, yeah. you know, earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that 
Austin is being mentioned with San Francisco, Boston, New York now. How has that kind of narrative success, do you think, bled over to broader flyover country? Well, it's interesting because I think it shows that we can do it in flyover country. I mean, there's no place attitudinally is more flyover country than Texas. Interestingly, it's not the woe is me kind of rust belt flyover country. It's like, how dare you fly over me? Look what we got here, right? It's a different kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. So I think that the, the success of Austin and Texas has shown us in flyover country that it can be done. I think people are drawing lots of inspiration from, from that. And I hear that all the time when I talk to people. On the other hand, though, what's interesting is, as I talk to people about flyover country, there's resistance from people elsewhere in flyover country to to include Texas because it's kind of like, well, Texas already has succeeded, (laughs) you know, and especially to include Austin. I mean, Austin is looked at as on the next level. You know, can we really talk about an Austin in the same context as what we're trying to do in Indianapolis or St. Louis, you know, or Columbus? Well, no, they've got it figured out there. Well, so there's definitely a tension, even within people who kind of share this point of view. Do we embrace Austin or do we look at them as, oh, you know, crap, now we got to become the next Austin instead of the next Silicon Valley. So it's really interesting how it plays out. So looking to the future then, kind of across this whole region, what are the biggest issues do you think that the, the region faces? I think the issue faces um, the reality that we need to we need to bootstrap ourselves much more effectively and take advantage of the legacy advantages that we have. Number two, we need to bootstrap ourselves and in terms of venture capital. I mean, if you look at even the latest statistics from the third quarter of last year, the National Venture Capital Association, I I total up the numbers, like it was still over 80% of all venture capital still originates in three states, Massachusetts, California, and New York. And so you can have things like Steve Case, who founded AOL. He's got something called Revolution Now. You know, until COVID, they would take a bus and they'd you know get a bunch of VCs from the coast. They'd go through flyover country. I think they even went down into Arkansas one time, maybe Texas. They're like, oh, guys, look at all these great opportunities, little tech startups in, in all these places in flyover country that you can invest in and snap up. And sure, give them some capital, but then the exit – you know, when you exit, where does the money go? It goes back to the coast. So I think that's a huge, huge challenge for us, uh, even in Texas. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure Texas is among, you know, fourth or fifth in terms of VC dollars being raised, but nobody can touch those other three states. And it's even getting bigger. I mean, there was a story in the New York Times this morning about the frothiness in the IPO in investments in tech companies generally. And every company in that article, it seemed to me, I, I, I didn't identify all of them, but they were all on the coast. So that's a huge, huge problem. And then I think the third thing is just the continued consolidation of power, not only in the federal government, but especially in big tech. I mean, everything that people have thrown against uh, all the big tech companies in Silicon Valley, you know, privacy concerns, antitrust threats, all that just hasn't seemed to stick. And so they, they keep taking over more and more of our lives in flyover country and everywhere else. And, you know, how do you resist that? How do you resist that transformation of your way of life? Because we still live out here. You know, we don't just live in the metaverse. Um, And everything that happens with big tech affects the way we live and how we can enjoy our lives in the rest of the country. So that's a huge challenge. So I want to go from the challenges to the optimistic side. Dale, this has been great. We always end our podcast with the same question. What's next, Austin? I think for Austin, it's got to be more of the same that you're doing while also recognizing your leadership in flyover country and just the uniqueness, I think, of Austin in terms of being that blueberry and the tomato soup or whatever you want to call it. And it's got to be a challenge going forward, I think, to balance the political tensions that your success, you know, raises with the opportunities ahead. And, uh, you know, I think that I see nothing but blue skies ahead for Austin, but it's got to be well done and well managed. So podcasts like yours that just kind of throw what's happening in the, in the area into relief, I think are, you know, really important to that discussion. Fantastic. Dale, thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me. So what's next, Austin? We're glad you've joined us on this journey. Please subscribe at your favorite podcast catcher, leave us a review and let your colleagues know about us. 
This will help us grow the podcast and continue bringing you unique interviews and insights. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.